1965, the BBC became the subject of great controversy when it refused to broadcast one of its own films, announcing that it was too shocking. The film, The War Game, dramatised the probable effects on the UK of a nuclear war. Now on BBC Radio 4, film and television director Michael Apted reveals new evidence of the involvement of the government in this decision. Fifty years ago, a young director called Peter Watkins made a powerful and groundbreaking film that dealt with one of the biggest fears of the time. Yet its transmission was stopped at the 11th hour. This could be the way the last two minutes of peace in Britain would look. The film The War Game dramatised an imagined nuclear attack on the UK in the style of a news report. Its scenes of radiation sickness, summary executions under martial law, firestorms and widespread panic were directed with such tremendous skill that it went on to win an Oscar and become a huge influence on a generation of filmmakers, including me. 16 a.m., a single megaton nuclear missile overshoots Manston Airfield in Kent and airbursts six miles from this position. At this distance, the heat wave is sufficient to cause melting of the upturned eyeball, third degree burning of the skin, and ignition of furniture. Twelve seconds later, the shock front arrives. The war game showed some of the extreme measures the government was likely to take after a nuclear attack. As far as is known, it is at present planned by the civil defence that each doctor, working in a forward medical aid unit, place every casualty into one of three carefully defined categories to determine whether or not that casualty is worth hospital treatment. It's the third category that are worst. These, it's just hopeless. This doctor knows that each patient he places in the holding section will be left to die in pain without drugs. Peter Watkins had constructed the scenes based on what he could find out about our own government plans and also on the experience of the authorities in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, as well as Germany after the firestorm of Dresden. It was horrific, but most importantly, it showed that millions of British people could not rely on the government's civil defence plans to save them in the event of a nuclear attack. The authorities would be overwhelmed, and their advice on how to protect ourselves was revealed as propaganda. In 1965, that news would have had enormous political impact. It's been estimated that a nuclear attack on Britain using approximately 160 single megaton missiles would immediately kill or seriously wound between one-third and one-half of her entire population. It would destroy from 50 to 80 percent of all her main food production and storage facilities and from 50 to 80 percent of the power plants needed to run them. For the past 50 years, Watkins has argued that the BBC bent to the will of the government against its principle of independence, while the BBC has argued that it made the decision on its own. In November 1965, the BBC's Director General, Sir Hugh Carlton Green, announced the ban with this statement. The BBC has decided that it will not broadcast the war game, the film on the effects of nuclear war in Britain made by Peter Watkins. This is the BBC's own decision. It has been taken after a good deal of thought and discussion, but not as a result of outside pressure of any kind. When the television service undertook the making of a film on this subject, it recognised the risk that the film might turn out to be unsuitable for general showing. In the event, the effect of the film has been judged by the BBC to be too horrifying for the medium of broadcasting. The BBC, at its highest level, was very keen to get across that there had been no pressure from the government to stop the broadcast. And they also made it clear that the reason for the ban was because it was too horrifying. Both of these simple assertions conceal a far more complex situation that went to the heart of the BBC's relationship with the state. In this programme, we can reveal previously unseen government papers that shed more light on the truth behind the banning of Peter Watkins' The War Game. Cabinet Office files now declassified and obtained under a Freedom of Information request by Professor John Cook of Glasgow Caledonian University strengthen the argument that pressure was applied and that Whitehall mandarins 
and a senior member of Harold Wilson's cabinet were involved throughout the BBC's deliberations. And these are the cabinet office files, some of which were previously secret. Here's um, Professor John Cook. Lord Normanbrook was the chair of the BBC Board of Governors and as soon as he and Hugh Green, the BBC Director General, had seen the war game, immediately they went to government. Um, at a luncheon with Herbert Bowden, who was the Lord President of Council. Now, Herbert Bowden uh, was the leader of the House of Commons, so a Labour MP. The first key file that we have is dated 8th September 1965. And this letter is um, written to Derek Mitchell, Harold Wilson's private secretary at 10 Downing Street. So 10 Downing Street were involved in this right from the very start. Memo, 8th of September, 1965. To Derek Mitchell, the Prime Minister's office, 10 Downing Street, from Dennis Trevelyan, Private Secretary, to the Lord President. As you know, Lord Norman Brooke is himself apprehensive about showing such a film to the public. And he is, of course, fully apprised of the embarrassment that could be caused if it were made to appear that the government uh, implicated in the decision whether or not the film should be shown. After discussion, Lord Normanbrook suggested to the Lord President that, as a first step, the film should be shown to Sir Burke Trend, together with officials from other departments. The chairman of the BBC's governors suggested to a member of Harold Wilson's cabinet that Whitehall officials should be allowed to see a preview of the film so they could express their views on it. From the BBC's own internal files, more can be gathered about the involvement of Whitehall in the decision to ban the war game. Despite later telling the public that the ban had been the BBC's own decision, on the 7th of September 1965, Lord Normanbrook wrote to Sir Burke Trend, the Cabinet Secretary, suggesting the BBC shouldn't take all the responsibility. I doubt whether the BBC ought alone to take the responsibility of deciding whether the film should be shown on television, or, if it is to be shown, of deciding when it should be put on. It seems to me that the government should have an opportunity of expressing a view about this. I should like, therefore, to suggest that, in the first instance, the film should be seen by senior officials of the departments concerned. So Lord Normanbrook, with the blessing of the Director-General, Sir Hugh Carlton Green, invited a group of the country's top Whitehall mandarins to a screening of the film at TV Centre. They were Sir Burke Trend, his private secretary, William McKindo, head of the Home Office, Sir Charles Cunningham, Brigadier Lewis from the Chiefs of Staff, representing the British Armed Forces, George Leach of the Ministry of Defence, and Alan Wollstonecroft, the Deputy Director General of the Post Office, which at that time was responsible for granting the BBC a licence to broadcast. From the BBC, Governor Sir Robert Lusty attended, together with John Arkell, the Director of Administration, and Oliver Whitley, Hugh Green's Chief Assistant. We asked a former Chairman of the BBC Governor, Sir Christopher Bland, to give us his reaction to one of his predecessors inviting government officials to comment on a programme before it was broadcast. Uh, Astonishment. Astonishment that the BBC would uh, agree to something as unprecedented as showing a film before transmission. Uh, And that's absolutely amazing. This is a really bad idea. Why don't you show them all our programmes and ask whether they like them? Um, I think, to be fair to the politicians, they tiptoed round it and didn't want to see it themselves and kept saying, this is a decision for the BBC. But if you show a film to such significant members of the administration, then you are taking the decision at least partially out of the BBC's hands and the fact that it was then not shown, which presumably was absolutely what they would have liked, reinforces that view. The BBC has always prided itself on its independence from government and certainly I never had any pressure from either John Major, who appointed me, or from Tony Blair, who reappointed me, on any programme matters. Sir Christopher Bland, Chairman of the Board of BBC Governors from 1996 to 2001. As Cabinet Secretary, Sir Burke Trend was the country's most senior civil servant and the most senior policy advisor to the Prime Minister. 
cabinet secretaries have far-reaching powers and are responsible for overseeing the intelligence services and civil defence. The chairman of the BBC Governors, Lord Normanbrook, knew this very well, as he had been cabinet secretary himself from 1956 to 1962. He wrote this minute for the governors, summarising his view of events. After the showing of the film, we had a short discussion about it. I began by stating the case for showing such a film. The essence of this case was that the policy of nuclear deterrent was conducted on an abstract intellectual level, with little public appreciation of the practical realities involved, and that if in a democracy the people were to take their proper share in influencing decisions on such policies, they ought to have a clearer imaginative picture of the realities of nuclear warfare. I put this as forcibly as I could. The officials agreed that this was the major question for decision, but they preferred to reserve judgment on it until they had been able to reflect and discuss among themselves. I will arrange for Sir Burke Trenn to keep me in touch with the progress of these discussions in Whitehall about this film. As soon as he got back to his desk from the screening, Oliver Whitley, the man most trusted by the DG, who had been Green's deputy when he ran the World Service, wrote this memo to Lord Normanbrook in support of broadcasting the film. Confidential. From O.J. Whitley to the chairman. Subject. The war game. The only thing that can safely be said about the effect of the film is that it would tend to accentuate existing attitudes. Some would join civil defence, some CND. I reason that a very considerable moral responsibility rests on the BBC to make this film available to be seen by as many people as is practicable. I wonder if, whatever may be the gravamen of the advice we get from our Friday visitors, the right thing might be to make the film as good as we possibly can. You haven't asked for my comments, but won't mind having them, I know. Meanwhile, the Sir Humphreys of Whitehall were discussing their reaction to the war game, what their strategy should be, and what advice to give their ministers. They had to bear in mind that Harold Wilson's government was about to announce the results of a major review of the country's civil defence plans. They realised that the amount of current funding of civil defence was effectively a waste of money because nuclear war had been realised by that stage was unsurvivable, at least at the heart of the, the strike. So therefore, the government were looking closely at that very period at civil defence funding and whether to actually cut it back. The war game comes along. And this could therefore make it politically difficult if a film was shown in the autumn of 1965 showing the, the inadequacy of civil defence. On one level, it could boost unilateralism, but on the other level, it could make it politically difficult for the, the Labour government then to argue for a, a reduction in civil defence funding. And this is noted by the civil servants as they debate the film uh, in, the, it's in the files. The UK's civil defence plans had evolved during the Second World War as a reaction to the German bombing campaign. Locally organised groups of civil servants and volunteers worked with the police, the fire services and armed forces to administer first aid, shelter and feed the public. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, it had been assumed that a modified version of our civil defence plan could cope under a nuclear attack. But by the early 60s, the government's belief in the ability of civil defence to cope had all but disappeared. Here's Duncan Campbell, whose groundbreaking 1982 book, War Plan UK, exposed how successive governments had kept this a secret. The first reaction of the military and uh, political establishment in Britain to the Russian acquisition of atomic weapons was, we can do it. We've got the Civil Defence Corps, we've got air raid precautions, um, we've got these marvellous British spirit and volunteer armies that will sort out everything. And so they attempted to respond to the uh, potential of a, a Soviet atomic attack on the UK by rebuilding what had been there in the Second World War and making some adjustments. And they believed that that would work. So things like evacuation, um, uh, rescue, digging people out of uh, their collapsed houses and so on, all the stuff that had had been done, was going to be done again. But then a new reality dawned in 1955, and for many years it was secret, which was they realised that the hydrogen bomb, the thermonuclear weapon, made none of this possible. And from that point on, what they said in public about 
the Civil Defence Corps, the rescue volunteers, the digging you out, they knew it was a lie. They certainly weren't ready to share that fate with the people who elected them, who paid for the weapons. Uh, that was the problem. So what you had in the 40s and the 50s at first was a belief that you could do something about a nuclear attack. That possibility died inside the administration at first in utter secret. As part of the review of civil defence plans, the government turned to the results of the 1962 NATO exercise Forlex 62, which had imagined a Soviet nuclear attack on Europe and the UK. It was so thorough that thousands of reservists had actually received practice call-up papers. Nuclear bunkers were manned and hospitals were evacuated. The secret report summing up its findings stated, The damage and the rapid development of fallout made it almost impossible to conduct any organised life-saving in the regions to the east and south. Those regions became Z-zones, where survivors had already received a lethal dose of radiation and were abandoned. They included London, Birmingham and large parts of Kent and Essex. The man who had headed up the British side of the NATO test was Sir Charles Cunningham, one of the mandarins invited to give his views on the war game. Lord Normanbrook, the chair of the BBC Governors, was also very knowledgeable about Forlex 62 and the consequences of a Soviet nuclear attack on the UK. He had overseen the civil defence plan while Cabinet Secretary. One has to look at it in terms of the revolving door between the BBC chairmanship at the time and in government, the fact that the former secretary to the cabinet then becomes the chair of the, the BBC Board of Governors. And at the very top of the BBC, there was probably still an attitude and an ideology that stemmed back from World War II. The, the working together for the, 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 the public good, uh, the defence of the realm uh, between the BBC and Whitehall and then government behind Whitehall. This is only remembered 20 years after the end of the, the Second World War. Uh, it's also the fact that the BBC uh, saw themselves as, as in matters of defence, which went beyond party political lines, that this meant that the government um, had to be consulted if there was a defence issue. And um, the, the problem, therefore, for Hugh Carlton Green um, as the BBC's Director General, the Editor-in-Chief, is that there was a long tradition that in matters of and the euphemism is used as quote-unquote public policy. In matters of public policy, um, the government need to necessarily be consulted. Professor John Cook. The war game had become a huge problem for the BBC. How had a 29-year-old director, brilliant but already clearly something of a maverick, been allowed by his managers to put the BBC in this position. Michael Daniel Kelly, aged 17, dead in the gutter of the Kalman Josef Street, Budapest, Hungary. The date is Monday, October the 29th, 1956. It is morning, a harsh morning. Before joining the BBC, Peter Watkins had directed four short films, including the wonderful and shocking Forgotten Faces, about the crushing of the 1956 Hungarian uprising against Soviet occupation. Here is one of the dead, the schoolboy. He will be buried in an improvised plot in the nearby park. One of the men goes off to find the boy's family to tell them of his death. They must come and identify the body. The newsreel-style camera work and use of amateur cast are so effective it's hard to believe that what we're watching isn't real Hungarians being massacred in their streets. In fact, it was shot in 1961 in Canterbury. Its success led to a job at the BBC for the ambitious and talented Watkins, and the troubled times inspired grander films. Good evening, my fellow citizens. The Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962, when Russia and the USA had come to the brink of war, had focused minds on the horror of a nuclear attack. Within the past week, Unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. In August 1963, Peter Watkins proposed a film that would show these horrors. He wrote to his BBC boss and mentor, Hugh Weldon. 7th of August, 1963. Subject, proposed documentary on consequences of nuclear warfare. 
We all of us know and accept the fact that nuclear warfare might possibly be the outcome of present world politics. We all of us condone the presence of nuclear weapons, which could mean in one hour the death of 10 or 20 times the number of people assassinated during the Jewish pogroms. And yet, really and honestly, not one of us gives a blind nickel in thought to what, in effect, we might well be responsible for. Children covered in gaping third-degree burns. Healthy men reduced to pus oozing lumps. Women turned sterile in a moment. We will be responsible for this. And yet, although we know from Hiroshima and Nagasaki what in terms of human destruction the H-bomb means, we either shove it far back out of thought in our cosily clogged and shrouded minds, or we, in fact, positively support it. The average mind of today refuses to think of, let alone accept, the most soul-shuddering decline of basic humane thinking in the history of mankind that is in us all now. And that is why I want to make this film. Why, in hell's name, before it's too late, don't we kick ourselves in the pants and begin to behave like human beings? Hugh Weldon believed that the 29-year-old Watkins had yet to gain the experience needed to pull off a film like this. And instead he commissioned a docudrama about the Battle of Culloden, which imagined a TV news crew had covered the British Army's slaughter of Bonnie Prince Charlie's troops in 1746. Culloden won Watkins a BAFTA, and he pressed for the chance to cover nuclear war. 31st of December 1964. From Hugh Weldon, head of documentary and music programmes, TV, to Kenneth Adam, director of TV. Now that Culloden is over, and after a great deal of anxious thought... I have suggested that this project should go forward. Other factors apart, I am anxious to keep Watkins, and to do so, I must certainly let him get this film out of his system. The major difficulty is the political factor. The programme will, of course, be horrifying. I make the recommendation, however, with the greatest anxiety. So Watkins was off with the bit between his teeth. As part of his research, he contacted several MPs, one of them was the former Conservative Secretary of State for War, Sir Peter Thornycroft, who immediately shot off a warning letter to Sir Hugh Green. Mr Peter Watkins came to see me today about a film he is contemplating making for the BBC in connection with nuclear warfare. I was much impressed by his enthusiasm and ability, but I explained to him my doubts about his film. It seems to me that it is going to be extremely difficult to make a film which presupposes the failure of the deterrent, which is not, in effect, heavily biased in favour of those who wish to abandon it or control of it, as opposed to those like myself and the Conservative Party who believe that the maintenance of a deterrent is the best instrument in an imperfect world. The film about Culloden, which I understand he wrote before, may have caused a certain altercation between north and south of the border, but it would be as nothing to the uproar which could take place if the BBC came out with a film about the deterrent which was straight propaganda for the Committee for Nuclear Disarmament. I mention these matters to you because I feel this is something to which you should give your close personal attention. As if it ever came about, it would be likely to lead to considerable political comment. This shot across the BBC's bows from the old Etonian World War II Royal Artillery officer gave Green a taste of what was to come. The initial reaction of Hugh Weldon, as the political pressure started to mount in early 1965, is to put across his protégé's case. He wrote to Kenneth Adam, the director of television, saying that Watkins' intention was not to propagandise for CND, and that Watkins thought the film was, quote, quite as likely to back up the informed views of those who believe that our proper policy is to have a deterrent as it is to back up the considered views of those who believe in unilateral disarmament. Not only had Watkins alerted the politicians to his planned film, he had also made contact with the Home Office, asking them for information on civil defence plans. He sent a list of 40 questions to them, which they refused to answer mostly on security grounds. Most importantly... His approach had the effect of ramping up the pressure on Hugh Green and the BBC. The Home Office's reaction to Watkins' questions is fascinating because it illustrates an aspect of a long-standing link between the BBC and Whitehall over matters of civil defence. Dennis Winter was the BBC's designated first point of contact with the Home Office. 
The Home Office had been in touch with me about an approach to them by Peter Watkins. Winter then sent a memo to his boss, John Arkell, the BBC's Director of Administration. I was told that Watkins has also been in touch with other government departments and with local authorities, resulting in a meeting of these various departments at official level at which concern was expressed over the effect such a programme might have on the public. Home Office officials fully appreciate the Corporation's position of independence in the planning of its programmes and do not wish to interfere. At the same time, they feel that the Government and the Corporation are partners in the civil defence field and therefore hope that any programme which, in the Government view, could be against the national interest or prejudicial to security should be prepared with the utmost care and responsibility and be controlled at the highest level within the Corporation. The fact that the Home Office regarded the BBC as partners in the civil defence field might seem surprising. But in the event of a nuclear attack, the government would use the BBC's transmitters and the BBC had its own nuclear bunker near Eastham, from where it would continue some broadcasting operations on behalf of the government. The Central Government War HQ bunker near Bath would also shelter some BBC staff in the event of a nuclear war. It's unclear how much Watkins knew of these links at the time he was researching the film. But as events developed, the ties between the BBC and civil service at the highest level would frustrate his plans. The influence of the Home Office becomes clearer when Dennis Winter again writes to his boss John Arkell, this time to tell him that Whitehall had no desire to challenge the BBC's independence in the planning of its programmes. They have never suggested that we should avoid a programme on the subject. They do feel, however, that it is a very dangerous subject and if not handled with expert knowledge as well as with exemplary care, it could prove to be against the national interest. Winter then goes further than just relating the views of the Home Office. He reminds John Arkell that Lord Normanbrook was once the chair of the Civil Defence Committee and that he ought to be consulted. It is probably difficult for the Corporation to set itself up as the ultimate judge as to whether or not a programme is or is not against the national interest. It seems to me that only the government can take this responsibility. Because of our special relationship with the government in the defence field, this is perhaps the one subject on which we are not our own masters. These are the words of a BBC executive, not a Whitehall Mandarin. John Arkell then writes to Hugh Green, and the Home Office concerns gather momentum. 18th February 1965. Confidential. Knowing something of the government thinking on this particular issue, I have some sympathy with the Home Office's difficulties in understanding how the Corporation can ensure against breaches of security without the help of the particular government security experts. Zealous as I am about safeguarding the independence of the BBC, I do wonder whether in this case we could not enlist the Home Office's help without compromising our independence or prejudicing the impact of the final programme. I also question whether a senior Home Office official seeing an advance showing of the programme would be as useful as getting their advice from time to time as the programme is being made. Although carefully measured, two sides are forming in the confidential, internal BBC discussion. Director of Administration John Arkell and BBC Executive Dennis Winter were both asking for close Whitehall involvement, while Hugh Weldon, who had commissioned the film, and his boss, Kenneth Adam, who were both programme makers, were pushing for the war game to be made with little interference. 22nd of February, 1965. From Hugh Weldon, Head of Documentary and Music Programmes, Television. Subject, Documentary on Nuclear Warfare, to Director of Television. The anxieties, quite rightly, felt by Director of Administration and Winter are not a new factor. The anxiety was recognised by us and taken into account when the timetable of action was set up. I hold strongly that the next stage is to examine the script. Until this is done, there is no point in deciding precise further moves. John Arkell mentioned a Home Office official seeing an advance showing of the programme as being less satisfactory than being involved all through. I am sure this is not so. Since the Home Office had refused to answer Watkins' 40 questions, Hugh Weldon had argued that the script and filming could go ahead without their direct help and he wasn't going to agree to the Home Office watching what they did every step of the way, which is what John Arkell had suggested. But he was willing to accept the Home Office might be allowed to see a rough cut of the film. It seems Weldon was creating a muddy middle ground between autonomy and collaboration. The same day that Weldon wrote that memo, 
and with growing concern at high levels at the BBC, the war game was confirmed as a commission at 60 minutes duration and with a budget of £7,000. A week later, Hugh Weldon read the script and wrote to Kenneth Adam, director of TV, in upbeat mood. I think personally that already this script shows the general tendencies that we were hoping would emerge. That is to say, it provides food for thought rather than a statement of propaganda. It is as likely, I think, to make people want to join civil defence as to make others think that civil defence is futile. It is likely to make civil defence a subject of real discussion rather than of empty words from one side or the other. Speaking purely in political terms, a transmittable programme is emerging. Kenneth Adam then passed the memo on to Hugh Green with these handwritten comments in the margin. Director General, I have read the script carefully. I agree with Controller of TV. The script allows for great flexibility. I think we ought to go ahead and then see it in various stages of rough cut. So the war game went ahead and filming took place in Kent in April 1965. Watkins had assembled a cast of amateurs from local theatre groups who would portray the dazed and badly injured victims of the nuclear attack. His film crew included former newsreel cameraman Peter Bartlett and film editor Michael Bradzel, who both went on to distinguish careers in film and television. His stunt coordinator was Derek Ware, who became well known for his work on Doctor Who in the 60s and 70s. Derek remembers that Peter Watkins was unconventional in his approach to filmmaking. He'd arranged for a condemned row of houses to be saved by the council so they could be set on fire and destroyed as part of the filming. The camera was following me, and at the last minute, they, they saw that the roof was caving in, mm. so they scarper back. They just disappeared, and I was running around <laughs> on my own on this house that was on fire. And uh, the roof actually fell in. Luckily, I got into a cupboard, some kind of a cupboard there, and I just got, it, got out of it. And, uh, of course, they were panic-stricken, and I disappeared in this cloud of smoke, and everybody thought I, I was, uh, I'd been caught. I think I was playing a fireman, and, as, as luck would have it, I lost my helmet. People were crying, and, oh. And, of course, you never knew what was going to happen next on a, on a Peter Watkins epic. <laughs> then the police were called in, and, and uh, there was a lot of trouble on that. <laughs> Why were the police called? Uh, because the, we were hanging people in the, in the street, and the, the Peter hadn't got permission to do this. And they said, oh, we're with the BBC. And it was saying they, it was a terrible row at first, but then uh, everything was smoothed over. The war game stunt coordinator, Derek Ware. Watkins' methods were also criticised by the Actors' Union Equity, who did not like his use of amateurs in the cast in place of their members. But filming was completed, and through the summer of 1965, Watkins edited and re-edited after a number of viewings by Hugh Weldon and Dick Corston, the head of documentaries. Both were concerned at the closing sequences which showed food riots and the execution of looters by a police firing squad. On the authority of the Regional Commissioner under Article 17 of the new National Emergency Code dealing with civil disturbances and the prevention of Crown appointed officers from carrying out their lawful duty, John Edward Jarrett and William Michael Eves are hereby sentenced to death by firing squad. May God have mercy on their souls. Neil. Watkins refused to cut okay. the execution scene. I was outraged at some of the attacks that had been levelled at Watkins' film. Duncan Campbell. That it was unrealistic to see firing squads. It was unrealistic to see the shortages of resources leading to riots at food depots. Or that it was unrealistic that um, police constables might do mercy killings of radiation damage victims. And the reason it was outrageous because all these things were being exercised and written into game scenarios every two years. Peter called it the war game. It was a game that they were playing every couple of years, exactly as he depicted. As Watkins refined his film in the edit, the 20th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima on the 8th of August received extensive coverage in the press. On the 2nd of September, the war game was shown to Sir Hugh Green and Lord Normanbrook by the head of television, Kenneth Adam. Adam wrote, They both agreed it had been an impressive documentary, but had felt that the responsibility for its public showing was too great for the BBC to bear alone. The chairman therefore proposed to take soundings in Whitehall from senior civil servants, probably including officials in the Ministry of Defence. 
This internal BBC memo was then followed by the secret letter to Cabinet Secretary Burke Trend, inviting him and others to take part in the decision-making. Watkins, who had got wind of the Whitehall screening, wrote to Hugh Weldon on the 14th of September, threatening to resign. Weldon wrote back to say, Your future. The formal position is clear. The BBC's decision to consult further on this important and powerful documentary arises solely from its responsibility, which must override all other considerations, to act in the public interest. Three days before the Whitehall Mandarin saw his film at TV Centre, Watkins formally resigned in protest, but also took up a prestigious position at Albert Finney's film production company, Memorial Enterprises. I'm Michael Apted, and you're listening to The War Game Files on BBC Radio 4. After seeing The War Game, the Ministry of Defence, the Post Office, the Military Chiefs and the Home Office went away to consider their reactions, and their boss, Cabinet Secretary Sir Burke Trend, helped focus their deliberations by writing to them all. The War Game. One. Do we agree that by comparison with a good many other films of violence which are shown on television... This is not a horror film to which we could take exception on grounds of public decency. Two. If so, there seem to be only two broad grounds on which we could object, i.e., A, that the film is inaccurate or misleading, or B, that it would be politically inexpedient to show it publicly. Three. If we were to base ourselves on the former argument, we must be able to argue that, one, the film is misleading as it implies that the situation is more likely to happen than not to happen. In short, is it to be assumed that we should slide into a nuclear holocaust as rapidly, automatically and helplessly as the film suggests? Two, the film is also unfair in writing down so heavily the effectiveness of civil defence precautions and the ability of the population to cope with devastation on a tremendous scale. Professor John Cook, who unearthed this previously secret memo, sees it as illuminating the determination in Whitehall to stop the war game reaching our sets. Many people will be surprised at some of the explicit language that's in these files, where it's not about an agonised decision about freedom of expression or indeed a discussion about the BBC's Charter of Independence. Nothing about that. It's all about, OK, we need to stop showing this film on television, but how do we do it and how do we present it? Cabinet Secretary Sir Burke Trend's memo continues... Alternatively, we could maintain that even if the film were altered in such a way as to meet the above criticisms, we should nevertheless still feel obliged to advise ministers not to consent to its public showing on the grounds that it would be politically inexpedient, that the film would be liable to cause unnecessary and undesirable alarm and despondency, and to touch off a renewed public argument on the issues of the independent nuclear deterrent, the CND campaign, etc., which the government would find inopportune. This could be a difficult and embarrassing argument to sustain. They might well be thought to be trying to use their authority over the BBC in order to sweep under the carpet an issue which they found to be politically embarrassing. So the Cabinet Secretary is flagging up the political sensitivities and arguments that could be deployed for and against a ban. He knows that only ministers can order a ban, and concludes with another reason to kill the film, which might appeal to the politicians, that the film may affect public attitudes to their civil defence policy. The right balance between these conflicting considerations is very much a matter of political judgment, i.e. it is for ministers to strike. It is complicated at this juncture by the fact that the government are engaged in a review of civil defence policy, the results of which will have to be announced fairly soon, and may be difficult enough to sell to public opinion, including our NATO allies, without further complications of the type which the film might create. After the Whitehall Sir Humphreys had seen the film and constructed their arguments against it, the next step was to advise their political masters, the Here Today Gone Tomorrow MPs in the Cabinet, of what was going on. Cabinet Secretary Sir Burke Trent met the Prime Minister. The secret Cabinet papers unearthed by Professor John Cook reveal Harold Wilson's reaction to the news. This is to confirm that it was agreed that you should indicate to Lord Normanbrook that Her Majesty's government, as a government, did not wish to offer any view on whether or not the film should be shown to the public. 
Harold Lawson had not seen the film and wasn't prepared to ask the BBC to ban it, but was happy for pressure to be applied to the BBC by the most senior figures in Whitehall. Wilson suggested that Sir Charles Cunningham of the Home Office, Sir Henry Harman of the MOD and Sir Burke Trend ought to express their views to Lord Normanbrook in a private meeting. And in addition, you should suggest ways of presenting the film which would put its controversial aspects into perspective. For example, it might be followed by discussion in the course of which balanced comment could be given on it. This comment would be bound to have a political character, but need not be blatantly so if the right people were chosen. After the Prime Minister had been briefed by Burke Trend, the Home Secretary Frank Soskis was briefed by his Permanent Secretary Sir Charles Cunningham. Sir Charles, you'll remember, had overseen the recent test of civil defence plans, which had concluded that the people of London and huge swathes of England would have to be left for dead after a nuclear attack. Sir Charles wrote to Burke Trent with a memo to confirm what the Home Secretary had said. The Home Secretary's personal view would be against the showing of the film. He realises, however, that the decision must be left to the BBC. From what he has been told about it, the Home Secretary thinks that it might well be possible to say to the BBC that the film is open to criticism on the grounds that the introduction is improbable and the presentation of the result of a nuclear exchange is extremely partial and one-sided. Having said this, ministers might go on to make it clear that the decision whether or not the film should be shown must be taken by the BBC itself and that the corporation must accept full responsibility for it. This is a classic piece of Whitehall arm-twisting that could have come straight out of the script of Yes Minister. Sir Charles Cunningham and his minister want to make it very clear to the BBC that this political bombshell may well explode in auntie's face. On the 5th of November, Lord Norman Brooke was invited to hear the government's views. Views that had been formed not by seeing the film, but by being briefed by their Sir Humphreys. After a meeting, he wrote a confidential memo to Hugh Green. I saw Sir Burke Trend, secretary to the Cabinet, this morning, about this film. He was accompanied by Sir Charles Cunningham, Home Office, and Mr A. Wollstonecroft, Post Office. The ministers had decided they did not wish themselves to intervene in any way. The officials who had seen the film were ready, however, to offer the comment that it seemed to them somewhat unbalanced in its presentation. It is also clear that Whitehall will be relieved if the BBC decides not to show it. Professor John Cook. The trail goes cold within the BBC as to who eventually took the decision to ban the film. Mm -hmm. But um, within the Cabinet Office minutes, there is a meeting held in Sir Buck Trend's room, so that's the Cabinet Office, on Friday the 5th of November 1965, at, at which Lord Normanbrook was, was present. Personal and confidential. Note of a meeting held in Sir Burke Trend's room, Cabinet Office, Friday the 5th of November 1965, at 9.45am. Lord Normanbrook said that his personal view was that it was a film that should not be shown. After discussion, it was agreed that Lord Normanbrook would take further soundings within the BBC and inform the Secretary of the Cabinet of the terms in which the BBC would announce its decision. As these meetings went on behind closed doors, Peter Watkins became suspicious. In a series of letters that grew steadily more angry, Watkins wrote to Hugh Weldon asking for an explanation. 29th of October 1965, personal and confidential. I believe that the reason my film is being quietly shelved is because the corporation wishes to retain the appearance of liberal independence of action without actually having to fulfil that action. Watkins decided to go public with his concerns and gave the Sunday Times an interview about the film. In mid-November, he wrote again to tell Weldon that the story would break that weekend. Dear Mr Weldon, the BBC's continued silence on this matter would seem to confirm that something is wrong somewhere and is wrong because of some form of political pressuring from Whitehall. By the 21st of November, he wrote an emotional note by hand to Weldon. What is being allowed to happen at the BBC is a ruthless, inconsiderate, unprofessional mess which, above all else, has wrecked the war game. Of that, there is now no doubt. On the 26th of November, 1965, the BBC announced that the film would not be shown. The BBC has decided that it will not broadcast the war game. This is the BBC's own decision. It has been taken after a good deal of thought and discussion, but not as a result of outside pressure of any kind. 
The effect of the film has been judged by the BBC to be too horrifying for the medium of broadcasting. Those on the left wing of the Labour Party, many of whom supported the unilateral banning of nuclear weapons, were concerned over events. Stan Ewans was Labour MP for Epping at the time. I was a member of the Tribune group, which was the left-wing group within the Parliament. The vast majority of them were strongly in favour of showing the film for the same reason as I was. I was appalled at what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and I was pretty well aware of the sort of devastation that nuclear weapons would cause if ever used. And I thought it would be a disaster for mankind. And naturally, I was concerned that it should be shown to try to alert people generally at the risk that we were running. Well, we were not uh, naive enough to believe that this was just a BBC decision. But it was quite clear to us, as in other issues, that the uh, government was anxious to suppress or to uh, prevent any uh, mass support for CND. Labour MPs Tom Dryberg and Woody Hamilton met Hugh Green at his office to ask what was happening. Hamilton told the Daily Telegraph, I am asserting that pressure was put on. I have seen Sir Hugh Green, Director General of the BBC, and gone into the matter with him. I think it is a very dangerous thing to stop a programme because it is horrifying and might shock viewers. The point is that nuclear war is horrifying in itself. When Willie Hamilton asked Labour Prime Minister Wilson in the Commons if there had been government interference in relation to the war game, Wilson replied, So far as rumours about the war game are concerned, the government have not interfered at all. Undeterred, Hamilton then tabled a question to Frank Soskis, the Home Secretary, asking if and why he had put pressure on the BBC to ban the film. Soskis replied, The BBC have made it clear that their decision not to show the film was not the result of outside pressure of any kind. In the aftermath of the announcement, the BBC put on screenings for MPs and peers, newspaper editors, defence correspondents and members of the cast and crew. The great and the good were invited to, to view the film. In some senses, it couldn't have gone better for Hugh Green because he, he managed to get the press on side because most of the press that went to see the film were defence correspondents. One notable exception, however, was Kenneth Tynan from The Observer who uh, did go along and see it at these NFT screenings and said it was the most important film ever made. Uh, needed to be needed to be shown, uh, but the overwhelming weight of press opinion at that time was on Green's side. Professor John Cook, Sir Hugh Green and Lord Normanbrook were both concerned about the lasting damage to the BBC and themselves. On the 28th of February, Normanbrook wrote to Green. I think I can honestly say that at the time when I first saw the script. I was pretty confident that for one reason or another we should not be able to use this film in a television programme. I believe that you were much of the same mind. In the result, we have spent quite a considerable sum of money to no purpose. I should have made it more plain then that in my judgment we should never be in a position to show such a film as this in a television programme. If I had taken this line firmly at that stage, the corporation would have been spared a lot of embarrassment. Who really decided to ban the war game? Did the BBC fold under pressure from the civil service and government? Just as the political pressure was mounting, with Whitehall's highest-ranking civil servants moving against the BBC, Sir Hugh Green had to go to Nigeria for a Commonwealth conference for several weeks. Green's biographer, Michael Tracy, feels this is important. Uh, I have no doubt in my mind that the decision is made by the governors. This ain't going out. Green is away. Green comes back and is presented with a fait accompli, basically. So he has a problem because the governors are not supposed to make those kinds of editorial decisions. It simply wasn't part of the unwritten constitution of the BBC. It just wasn't done. And Green went along with that because he had to. Michael Tracy. When Asa Briggs was writing the official history of the BBC, a summary of events was prepared from the internal files. It was written in 1976 by Leonard Mile, a distinguished BBC executive. The top line of the summary reads, The war game is an example of the chairman taking the final decision whether or not to broadcast a prepared programme. Did Lord Normanbrook take the decision while Sir Hugh Green was in Nigeria? 
I said at the start of this archive hour that this is a complex story and there are no simple answers. When Michael Tracy was writing his authorised biography of Green, he wrote a piece on it for The Guardian, which drew the conclusion that Lord Normanbrook had influenced Green's decision and, in effect, been the prime mover behind the ban. Green immediately fired off a letter to The Guardian saying the ban had been taken by him alone. Solely on its horrific character. One does not forget the atmosphere surrounding such a difficult decision. And I do not believe for a moment that Norman Brooke had been so influenced by his past or present contacts with Whitehall that he would have overruled my decision had it gone the other way. But when interviewed in 1987, just three weeks before his death, Sir Hugh Green gave a different answer. The decision not to show it after it had been made and seen was shared, really, between Lord Normanbrook and myself. The decision was not made against my wish. In fact, I think that I was more shocked by the programme than Normanbrook was. And the basis for the decision was not a political one. It was not that it would be embarrassing to the government uh, and an aid to the campaign for nuclear disarmament which made me decide that it couldn't be shown, it was because I could not face the responsibility of putting on the air a programme which was so shocking that old people living alone, for instance, or people who were somewhat disordered might be so much upset by it that they could go out of their flat and throw themselves under a bus. Here's Green's biographer, Michael Tracy, again. The idea that Green would pull a programme because it might upset some people, went again against everything he'd been doing for five years. Everything. I'd read hundreds of letters that he'd written from people complaining and saying, no, there's a watershed, or switch it off if you don't like it, you know? And so the idea that he pulled it on, on the grounds of people's sensitivities and emotions just never, never made sense. And then I saw the file. And it was Norenbrook. They, it was the establishment. I have to say that reading some of these files... Hugh Green does come across as, as a rather compliant servant, shall we say, of government and the Whitehall machinery. Certainly a lot of um, liberalising change happened when Hugh Green was in place within the BBC, and this was the era of the Wednesday play and Till Death Us Do Part and uh, many great changes. And I think Hugh Green allowed a lot of things to happen. And he had a very impish sense of humour, which is why he loved That Was The Week That Was, because it reminded him of the cabaret clubs in Berlin in the 1930s when he was a correspondent for the Daily Telegraph. But with TW3, when push came to shove and it offended the BBC Board of Governors, Green, ever the pragmatist, and in, 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 in his wish not to create conflicts, backed down, and so TW3 was taken off the air. And that's, the, the if you like, the precursor to the, the, the war game. Hugh Green will be remembered as a Liberal Director General, under whose stewardship the BBC fell into step with the Cultural Revolution of the era, found a satirical edge, and encouraged young talent. But his laissez-faire attitude made him enemies in government, and the next Chairman of the Board of Governors, Lord Hill, made his life so uncomfortable he decided to quit. And what of Peter Watkins? Now retired and living in France, he spent the last 50 years making campaigning films around the world, but has never forgiven the BBC. In 1968, he left the UK for, in his words, self-imposed exile. He politely declined to take part in this programme, but here he is talking about the war game in the late 1960s. My personal statements have been sometimes very emotional, and, and some people say over-emotional. I think that they have been relatively calm. Um, the war game was, I still feel, a relatively calm film, although people think otherwise. The purpose of the war game is not to say myself, A, you yoiks, this is what you should be doing, signed Pete Watkins, but instead to say, this is what I feel. Now come out and argue about it. And what of the film itself? Though the BBC banned the war game from TV for 20 years, it made the film available in cinemas. Through April and May, the British Film Institute put on screenings, which allowed the film to be entered for the 1966 Academy Awards and ultimately led to an Oscar for Best Documentary. I would have loved to have been a fly in the wall on the BBC that day when they discovered that the film that they had banned is now up for an Oscar. But their, their solution... Kenneth Adam, the director of BBC Television Service, 
said, oh, well, I'll go to Hollywood and collect the Oscar if we win on behalf of Mr Watkins. When Watkins heard about this, he went ballistic, um, even though he had long since left the BBC. He wrote an angry telegram over my dead body, and he, Watkins told me that he even said that he would chain himself to the BBC television centre and dismantle it brick by brick uh, if such a thing were ever to happen. So in the end, the BBC backed down, and instead... Uh, it was actually the actor Richard Harris who picked up the Oscar on behalf of Watkins at the 1967 Academy Awards. The war game became a cause celeb, screened at student unions and CND meetings across the United Kingdom, as Bruce Kent remembers. Well, we were shocked that uh, a so-called free country with a free expression in a, in a, of a legitimate way uh, should be suppressed. And I think the level of knowledge of what nuclear war might be a lot, lot like was minimal until the war game came along. And I think we got, I forget whether we bought them or hired them, but we had about three or four copies of the war game. And my early days of C&D were, were largely spent packing up the war game, taking it down to Euston or King's Cross or somewhere, and sending it Red Star out to another group somewhere around the country. That was a, It was a major part of our educational programme, major part. Bruce Kent of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. The politics of banning the war game were played out by a generation of men who had fought and won the Second World War and were in places of authority throughout politics, business, the civil service and, yes, the BBC. Their values were challenged by a brilliant young filmmaker, a visionary. He fought the fight but lost. Disillusioned and disappointed, he left Britain to work abroad. It was our loss. But the clarity, the courage and the vision of his work blazed a path for those of us who followed him. For that, we all owe Peter Watkins a great debt. The War Game Files was presented by Michael Apted.